Hey, what's up, guys? How's everybody doing? It's 3 p.m., and that means it's time for a new video. I thought uh, for today I would talk about uh, Yemen and the humanitarian crisis going on there. It just uh, it occurred to me that I haven't done a video yet on this topic, and uh, I just I, I saw an article a couple days ago that was up on CNN.com uh, talking about the nightmare that is uh, that is Yemen. And um, every couple months, there'll be like an article that pops up in the mainstream media, and then it kind of goes away and very little attention is paid to it. And um, this is this is like a trick of the mainstream media. This is this is the way they're able to, to basically say that they didn't not report on on the issue. But at the same time, they just won't give it anywhere near as much airtime or, or print time or print space. Uh, they, they just, you know, they kind of minimize this and then they build up other issues that get way more attention. So, you know, like Donald Trump meeting with uh, North Korea will be all day long on the news. But uh, Donald Trump giving the Saudis a hundred plus billion dollars in weapons so that they can starve the people of Yemen to death uh, gets virtually no time uh, on the mainstream media. So as far as I know, I'm one of the only people like one of a handful of people who have really uh, repeatedly talked about this issue in the mainstream media. I, full disclosure, I actually work for uh, CNN, uh, more specifically Headline News. So um, at, when I was on a, a SE Cup show, uh, Unfiltered, where I'm a regular contributor, and I was on, I, it was their last episode of, uh, of 2017, back in December, and we were all asked to give what our, our number one story of the year was what we thought the most important story and mine was Yemen and more or less what's going on in Yemen and I, I should say uh, that I, I give a tremendous amount of credit to uh, Scott Horton who's a, a really really brilliant writer over at uh, antiwar.com and um, the libertarian institute.org and he's he's probably the one who's taught me the most about this issue so I, I highly recommend checking out his stuff um, anyway, so I said that this was the, the, to me, the number one story of the year. It's, it's a war that the U.S. government is fighting in collusion with the Saudis. I mean, the Saudis are kind of our boots on the ground, but the U.S. government is supplying the weapons and we're refueling their, their fighter jets. And, and even just a couple months ago, it came out that we were more involved than even the, the military had led on to Congress. So Yemen is the poorest country in the Middle East, um, which is, you know, that's really, really poor. And uh, the, the Saudis put a full blockade around the country. It's led to a, a just humanitarian nightmare. Uh, the, the biggest cholera outbreak in, in modern recorded history. And um, it's when it's all said and done, it's, it's going to be hundreds of thousands of people that ended up dying in this conflict. It's the numbers are going to be staggering and, and they're dying of starvation and cholera. It's really, really brutal. What you're talking about are, you know, babies because cholera happens to uh, uh, disproportionately affect the very old and the very young. So you're talking about babies, one, two, three year olds who are dying by diarrhea and, and puking themselves to death. It's just, it's, uh, it's um, unimaginable how horrific it is. And uh, this, you know, it gets very, very little attention. Even the, the humanitarian crisis in Syria gets a lot more attention in the mainstream media. And no surprise why, it's because the regime doing it there is a regime that we want to overthrow. This is a, a regime that we've had planned since 2002 to, uh, to overthrow, speaking of uh, Bashar al-Assad. And um, you can go uh, listen to four-star general Wesley Clark break that down. But so when it's a regime that we want to overthrow, there's a lot of airtime, uh, a, a lot of coverage of the, the humanitarian crisis. But when it's the regime that we prop up and support doing it, you don't hear so much about it. And the, the reason why it, it should be uh, given way more attention, obviously, number one, because it's, it's a goddamn nightmare. But on top of that, this is easily solvable, easily solvable. And, um, you know, in, in Syria, you have this humanitarian crisis and it's like, well, what do they want to do? Well, uh, Donald Trump came out and said he didn't want regime change in Syria. And then his secretary of state at the time, Rex Tillerson, came out and said, we did we do want regime change in Syria. He outlined a plan. And that was one of the major bullet points of it was was overthrowing Assad. Pretty interesting, by the way, you'd think maybe the media would cover that story that the, the secretary of state just contradicted the commander in chief on what uh, uh, the, the goal of what the strategy of a military operation 
uh, or just a war, if you want to look at it more bluntly. Um, yeah, not even the Secretary of Defense, just the Secretary of the State decided, nope, we're going in a different direction. By the way, about a month later, that Secretary of State was uh, relieved of his command. Pretty big story, basically no attention from the mainstream media. Or if there was attention paid to it, it was like, oh, Trump can't even get his cabinet together. And, you know, the, the real story is quite a bit more interesting. But so in order to, to achieve that goal, We'd have to go in, have another regime change, which, by the way, is a big part of what led to this nightmare in Yemen, also led to a nightmare in Iraq, led to a nightmare in Libya. So we'd have to go back down this nightmarish path and overthrow uh, a another secular three-piece suit Christian protecting dictator in, uh, in Syria. In Yemen, if we wanted to stop the humanitarian crisis that's going on there, we'd have to make a phone call. That's it. We could make one freaking phone call and this whole thing could be brought to an end it's literally i mean all we have to do is exert a little bit of pressure on the saudis and get them to stop doing what they're doing let the humanitarian aid get in uh, cholera by the way is something that can be cured with fluids the, these these two-year-olds who are dying there it, this this can all be cleared up with some uh with with like some big bottles of gatorade so that's the situation that's going on in yemen and um for all the attention that's paid to the the North Korea summit or to the migrant crisis on our southern border, man, you you just get one occasional little uh, article here or there. And even on the CNN, uh, you know, CNN.com, when they write an article about it, it's usually kind of like put in this way, like, man, isn't this awful? Too bad we can't do anything about it. But uh, of course, we're the ones who are, are creating this entire mess. And one, one of the things that's really interesting to me about this and, and quite revealing is that uh, Donald Trump is the most passionately hated president in my lifetime, by far. I mean, I, I think in my lifetime and my parents' lifetime, probably, there's never been a, a president where the opposition so passionately hated the guy. And it's pretty amazing to me that if you're looking for a reason to, to hate Donald Trump, this wouldn't come up. I mean, forget the fact that, that you know, some... Uh, people are being separated from their families at the border. How about all these kids who are starving to death or dying from cholera? Why, why wouldn't that come up? And the only answer I can think of is, uh, it's a fairly simple one, but uh, Obama did it too. And that's the real problem. And that's why, you know, they didn't start knocking Trump at the border until it started escalating. When it starts escalating, then you can knock him because, ooh, this is worse than what Obama did. But if he's just continuing Obama's policy of separating children from their parents, eh, that wasn't enough. But then Jeff Sessions uh, pushed the zero tolerance, and now it's like, okay, we can get Trump for this. It's, it's really unbelievable. But I, I think that the, the worst and most impactful part of Barack Obama's legacy was destroying the anti-war left. If, if you go to the president before Barack Obama, George W. Bush, we had a, a thriving, vibrant anti-war left in this country. The left used to really oppose wars. And somehow Obama got in there, promised to end all of them, collected his Nobel Peace Prize, and slowly the left started, you know, you know, and then expanded all of the wars. It kept the wars that George W. Bush handed him going and then expanded them into, into multiple other theaters. And, um, and, and then the left basically was like, yeah, well... If it's a smooth-talking black guy with a D next to his name, then we're not really that interested in being anti-war anymore. And they started dealing with the issues that, that really matter, like microaggressions and, you know, uh, in, in, implicit bias or unconscious bias or something like that. And, you know, anyway, uh, the, the war in Yemen is the number one humanitarian issue. It deserves a lot more credit. By the way, when I was on a SE Cup show and I gave, I said this was my, the, the number one story, uh, that, that I wanted to talk about. Essie Cup and one of the other panelists uh, said that the, their number one story of the year was the Me Too moment. So that's what we're competing with. You know, a million cases of cholera, little kids puking and shitting themselves to death. But that can't get, you know, as much time, as much coverage as like uh, if someone 20 years ago said something inappropriate to somebody or someone grabbed someone on the ass or something like that. It's it's really just bizarre. It's, it's a weird, weird world we live in. And I, I don't, you know, besides the answer that I gave with Obama, I don't understand what else it could be that people on the left who want to have some cause and they want to hate this president, you know, they won't look at the fact that he's slaughtering people 
uh, or or at least enabling the, their slaughter, their starvation. He that doesn't seem to get any attention, but these same people will spend a lot of time bashing him for meeting with Kim Jong Un and trying to work out a peace deal. Man, are these priorities all out of whack? And um, I, I think what what I would like more than anything else would just be to see the return of some type of anti-war movement. It's a, it's a crazy world we live in. I to me the most consistent uh, the the most consistent anti-war voices that I see out there are uh, coming from like um, the white nationalists and stuff like that. So I, I don't know. Now God's playing some big practical joke on all of us or something. And, you know, I give props to the people on the left who remained anti-war the whole time. But the problem is that there's there's only like five of them. And uh, the rest have, you know, been chasing this like uh, Donald Trump's colluding with the Russian government. When you have like zero evidence that he's actually doing that. In fact, if he's a Russian puppet, he's not doing a very good job over in Syria where he's killed a few hundred Russians. But in reality, in actuality, Donald Trump is openly colluding with the Saudis, one of the worst governments in the world, one of the most just authoritarian, repressive governments in the world. He is colluding with them to starve the people of Yemen to death. Maybe it's worth paying attention to a little bit. All right, that's the video for today. I got uh, Owen Benjamin on my podcast, Part of the Problem. That'll be live at 6 p.m. on GasDigitalNetwork.com. Go check that out. All right, see you later.